Right. Uh, it's the... Um, so we're rolling now. It's the 2nd of March, 1991. And um, you could tell us of your... Yes, well, first I... First day... All right, I can... I, well, as an apprentice. Fortunately, uh, at my time of life, it's easier for me to recollect things that happened when I was... Um, a young teenager than it is for me to remember what happened last week. Mm. And I can clearly remember the first day that I ever went to work. Uh, unlike boys today, I had to do what my father said I was to do and uh, I had no choice as far as my occupation was concerned. He was been in engineering all his life and he expected his boys to do the same. My brother Fortunately, uh, took to it like a duck taking to water, but I never did really become really, although I completed an apprenticeship, I wasn't really interested. And uh, I clearly remember the first day that I ever went to work. Now, when I was a boy, and I'm going right back to 1922 now, which seems an awful long time ago, but remember that in those days, boys left school at 14 unless they were very brilliant, well, unless they were, I won't say brilliant, but unless they were fortunate mm. to have a good education, yes. which I, uh, I only had a, what we called a central education, which, had, which was really a glorification of the uh, elementary school of that time. Mm -hmm. um, we did, uh, we did do, well, one language at school, we did French, that was the only foreign language that we were expected to learn. Yes. Uh, the normal subjects that a boy learned at school were, were um, mathematics up to the... We only went up as far as the differentiation of calculus, which was a little more than the elementary school boys did, but nevertheless wasn't as great as the... Uh, um, Better educated boys did, mm. but I wasn't interested in, in being at school. I never liked it, and the happiest day of my life was when I left school and I could cock a snook at the masters mm. who I mm. had to be deferential to mm. and doff my cap previously. So now I could go along the street and instead of doffing my cap to my mm -hmm. masters at school, I just nod my head like that, yes. and it did me, my ego a great deal of good. Anyway, the first day I went to work, I was put to work, I was sent to uh, to work in the works office of the forge in the Derby Railway Works. Now, my business, my job there was to run uh, with messages and uh, and uh, dockets and things like that, various jobs for the people that were in the office, uh, mostly to the tradesmen who were who were working in the forge, and this was a vast area. It had this forge, as far as I remember, it had about 40 blacksmiths in it. Mm -hmm. And each blacksmith would have a number of strikers. Mm. These are the men who hit the hot metal for him, where he directed their attention uh, with his, either with his, with a tool that he was forming the, the piece of metal into. And if he was a, an expert, craftsman, uh, he would be engaged probably in welding. In, uh, and welding in those days was not electric welding or acetylene welding as we know it now. That was only in its infancy. Uh, the main large pieces of welding were done physically in two forges. In other words, if, a, if an, arm, a, an arm was being welded Mm -hmm. onto uh, a reversing shaft, a reversing shaft being the width of the engine, a piece of uh, metal with different arms welded on it at various angles, mm -hmm. which the uh, various parts of the engine were connected to. And when the reversing shaft, which was the big one that went right across the engine, when the, when the driver of the engine wanted to reverse the thrust of the, of the engine, uh, I'm speaking about a steam engine now, of course. Mm. He would uh, pull a huge lever across in his cabin. You probably, 
if you're old enough to remember seeing this actually happen in a railway station where a, an engine has come to a standstill and the driver of the engine wants to reverse his engine he has this great reversing handle which he pulls back well that was in turn connected to these huge rods which had to be physically welded onto the long arm of the reversing shaft and that was an expert job for a blacksmith and he would have to have the shaft that he was welding it onto in one fire and he'd have the the shaft that was the arm that was going to be welded onto it in another fire at, in a few feet away yes. a few yards away each con each fire being controlled by him as to its consistency and heat he would be the 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 expert mm -hmm. and then at a given uh, at a given signal his assistants, his strikers, would bring the arm that was to be welded onto this across quickly and place it into position on the large reversing shaft, holding it there in that given, at that given angle, in that position, at the correct welding heat, mm -hmm. which he had predetermined mm -hmm. by his expertise. And his strikers would, would hit that on the top, pushing it onto the shaft. And if I tell you that he had five strikers, each swinging a large sledgehammer, mm. the full arc of the sledgehammer on top of this welding arm, and if I tell you that the, 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 the strokes would come like this, two, three, four, five, six, as quickly as that, and each and in each case it was a complete arc, you can imagine that not only the, the blacksmith himself was an expert, but these men also were in their particular field, were experts in their own particular job because they never collided, their hammers never collided. Really? They were all just swung in, in a beautiful arc mm. and they were tap tapping mm. the whole time without any interference. Mm -hmm. And eventually that arm would be welded onto the shaft mm. by natural, when I say natural heat, I, I mean heat that was physically uh, decided upon without regard to any any technique of, of acetylene or uh, electric welding. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an expert job. Well, my job as a boy was be to run round to all these various uh, forges, these blacksmiths with, with job tickets and, uh, and, th and those sort of things. And I was an errand boy in the office. That's what it amounted to. I was an errand boy. And as such, being a very small boy, I was always small for my age. I still am, for that matter. But, uh, well, I'm not, not small now, but I'm, I'm short. And, but in those days, I was a whippersnapper. And these people used to uh, adopt me. They were, they were very kind to me as a boy. And I used to enjoy these chaps. They, they would be pulling my leg and mm. twitting me and having a great deal of fun. And that was my first day uh, at work. I hadn't been there very long before I got to know these blacksmiths very, very well. And they would sometimes give me sixpence, which was an awful lot of money to me. When they got their wages, they would, they would call me across if I'd been a good boy and they'd give me some coppers or sixpence, which was great because that didn't form part of my wages. And that was purely pocket money. I didn't have to tip that up to my mother and I had to tip my wages up to my mother and get some pocket money from her in turn. So this was extra, what we would call in my time, bunts. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they used to pull my leg too, and I remember one of them was a bit of a conjurer. And he said to me one day, now look, if you spot this coming down, you can have it. And he got a sixpence on his thumb, and he flipped this sixpence into the air, and he says, now catch it and it never came down. So I just couldn't believe this. I said, well, it, where is it? And he says, well, it's here, of course, and he showed it to me. I said, well, I never saw it come down. He says, well, now have another look. And so he flipped it up into the air again, and again I saw it go up into the air. I swear I saw it go up into the air, but it never came down. And so, of course, this created a great deal of amusement. Now, uh, he said to me, this was a it was a Friday afternoon, I remember this very clearly, because that was the day when the men got their wages. 
and uh, they didn't do a lot of work on a Friday afternoon. It was the end of the week, towards the end of the week, although in those days, of course, they used to have to work Saturday mornings as well. But Friday afternoon was a sort of a, an easy time, mm. and so they weren't very busy, and they used to have a bit of smoke, a bit of smoke a few fags and uh, enjoy a bit of fun. And so they came to me one day, and, and this particular uh, this particular blacksmith who was a bit of a magician, he said to me one day, now, he said, would you like to earn sixpence? And I said, oh yes. And he said, well, I'll, uh, look, he said, I really will give you the sixpence if you'll do what I tell you. Now, he said, do you think I could turn your waistcoat out, inside out, without you, without taking it off? And I said, no, of course you can't. He said, well, I can. Now, he said, what I want you to do, and he says, you'll get sixpence, don't worry, I'll give you the sixpence. What I want you to do is to put your hands behind your back and clasp your wrist, clasp your hands behind your back so that, you know, it can't, you can't possibly let it go. She said, never let it go, you must ever let it go. Now, he said, uh, first of all, unbutton your, your jacket, but not your waistcoat, because we, in those days we used to wear a jacket and a waistcoat underneath, buttoned up waistcoat. Mm. Now he said, uh, do that and then shut your eyes tightly until I tell you to open them. <laughs> so I did that, I did exactly what he told me. You can, I want you to imagine a small boy doing this sort of thing, but I had no, uh, I wasn't self-conscious at all. So I did it, thinking in terms of my sixpence that I was going to get later. <laughs> And I felt, I could feel him pulling and pushing and shoving my jacket about and I was being pulled about no end, but I never let go of my wrist. Then after a few minutes I could hear these, his, his uh, strikers and the other blacksmiths who gathered round by that time to watch the fun. I could, hear, I could hear them giggling and laughing and then eventually he said, all right, you can open your eyes. So I opened my eyes and, uh, and I looked down and I couldn't believe it because there was my jacket still on, <laughs> my waistcoat was still on, but it was inside out and buttoned up. Brilliant. Buttoned up inside out. And I just couldn't believe my eyes. And I looked down and there it was. Mm. Here you are. And he says, you've won your sixpence. So I got my sixpence. And as I picked up my sixpence, I looked up the workshop, which was a long, great long workshop with all these forges down. I actually think it would be oh, 150 yards long easily. It was very, there was a lot of people worked in it. It was a huge workshop. And I noticed at the far end the foreman walking down. Now his name was Mr. Roberts. I remember his name very clearly. He was, a, he was an ex-blacksmith, uh, of course, naturally being in charge of the blacksmith shop. He was a craftsman. He was an he was an expert craftsman, and uh, but he was a very easygoing, nice sort of chap, you know. Yes. And he was walking down towards me, and I was walking up the workshop with my waistcoat on, and I was vainly trying to <laughs> to cover it up with my jacket. And I got a, about two or three yards from him, and he suddenly collapsed with laughter. And he said, "Go on, boy, open your jacket. Let's have a look." And so I had to display to the foreman of the works, where I, of the shop workshop where I was. When I had to display to this works foreman my waistcoat, <laughs> done up inside out, and buttoned up under my jacket. Really? Now that's my that's uh, that's that's about that wasn't actually the first day, but that was within the within the first mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. of a, ever starting work. Mm -hmm. I was a very innocent boy, uh, very very innocent. I was brought up in a in a godly home, and I hadn't been exposed to the influences that mm -hmm. a lot of young people were. But believe me, uh, having started work and got him mixed up with the other boys, the other apprentice boys, uh, I soon became one of the lads, mm -hmm. and we had a great time together. Mm -hmm. But I never really uh, took to engineering as such, although I pursued my apprenticeship, and it did stand me in good stead later in life when during the Second World War I was went back into engineering because uh, I had to register, not being turned down for the forces, I had to register what, what my trade had been and uh, as a result of that I was enable to uh, be very 
successful during the Second World War, having my own engineering workshop, mm -hmm. which I prosecuted with vigor and uh, like everybody else during the war who, who worked for themselves or who were in business, we all made money. Mm -hmm. And I should think I made more money during those four years or five years of war than I could possibly have dreamed of. But anyway, that's my first day at work or my first week of work. So if that's of any use to you, uh, what the conditions were like when I was a boy, you're very welcome to them. They were very primitive in many respects because, uh, for instance, if you wanted to go to the toilet, mm. you had to have a ticket. <laughs> I won't tell you what they called the ticket, but it was a four-letter. It was a four-letter word, and you had to get this this ticket from the uh, from the charge hand or the supervisor. You see, and uh, if he uh, wanted to tease you, if you if it was very urgent, you know, he would he would attempt to tease you by saying that all the places were filled and things like this, but. Uh, nevertheless, when you got to the when you got to the toilet, it wasn't what you would expect. Uh, it was uh, there were individual seats agreed, but there was no doors to them, <laughs> and so you could you could see people sitting there in a row reading their newspapers if they were men, or reading their comics if they were boys, <laughs> and it was very primitive, I can assure you. No privacy. There was no privacy, whatever. Uh, but that was life. Well, that's all I'm going to tell you about my first day at work, oh, that's good. first week at work. But it was interesting. Mm. And uh, you got about three, you said, you know, about three minutes left. I've got three minutes left. Yeah, well, I, do, I, I improved from there. When I began to do practical work, uh, I was sent to what they call the grease corner. Mm. Now this was a special place where they used to make uh, screws and, and nuts and bolts and things like that. And we used to have little machines on which we turned the threads on the screws or, or tap the holes in the, in the nuts, as the mm. case may be. The whole area had to be, the whole operation had to be swimming in oil mm. for lubrication purposes. And as a result of that, it was called the grease corner. And we used to make all sorts of little nuts and bolts and and, uh, and things that the uh, craftsmen used to use in the, in the workshops. Mm -hmm. That was the grease corner. We used to put them in uh, what we called a a skip by the side of our machine when we'd made them. And when that machine, when that skip was full, we used to take them to be emptied and uh, and and checked on a little docket. And of course the very first day that you were there, somebody would come round and just as you'd got it nicely filled, they'd accidentally get their heel in it and tip it all over the floor. Oh, no. oh yes, and that happened to me. And, of mm. course, every, all the other boys would have a real good giggle and uh, see how you reacted to it. Well, I didn't react to it very kindly. And it was a red-headed boy that uh, came along behind me and tipped my skip over. So I promptly turned around and tipped him over. And that meant uh, the cry, yes, the cry went round then, a scrap, come on, there's going to be a scrap. <laughs> so uh, 12, 12 o'clock sharp, we have to go into the sidings and have a fight. And did we fight? We talk about gamecocks. We really leathered each other, much to the amusement of the older men. Yeah who formed a ring round us like a couple of gamecocks, and we really had a jolly good scrap. And uh, I'm bound to tell you that I came off very well, so much so that for the rest of my time that I was there, which was many years, uh, I, he was a that boy was a firm friend of mine, and we were absolutely inseparable, and we protected each other, and we never had any more bother. Mm. Neither of us had any more bother with any of the other apprentices because they saw that we could... Uh, we could acquit ourselves very well in mm. these circumstances. Mm. So, it, sometimes it's popular to put up a fight. Yes. It certainly was in my case, anyway. Yeah. Good. Well, that leaves that one.
go. Okay, we're off. You're off. Well, now I've... Um, I've sorry, just, you didn't mean, wait a minute. Tell me when to go. Okay. Right, well now I told you about my uh, experience as an apprentice in the engineering trade. Well, I told you, also told you that I didn't like the business and I got out of it as soon as I could. Well, the drill was when you, re when you were 21 and you finished your apprenticeship, you were automatically given the sack because that coincided in my case with the depression of 1930. And uh, so I automatically got the sack, the same as all the other apprentices, when I reached the age of 21. Well, I wasn't, uh, I didn't want to pursue the, the career at all because I wasn't interested in it, and it coincided with uh, uh, an offer being made to me, right out of the blue, of a job in an insurance company, which would, I thought, would be more appealing to me since it was a, a sort of an outdoor job visiting people. And uh, I had a flair, I think, probably for that kind of being an extrovert, sorry to say, for that sort of thing. So I accepted this job with a Prudential Assurance Company, and I stayed with them for a long time. I stayed in, uh, I, was, I got married. I was earning very good money within six months. I was married, and I was already out of uh, the clutches of national insurance, being too affluent to be a... a, a contributor and I became a voluntary contributor to National Insurance so that would give you an idea that I very quickly acquired a reasonable salary sufficient to get married anyway. Right.